Welcome to BizHack Live. My name is Dan Gretsch, founder and CEO of BizHack Academy and host of this weekly webinar series where we bring some of the best minds in business and marketing. And today we have a really special uh, day, one that I'm looking forward to learning and digging into. We're gonna be talking about the agile mindset for business. So a lot of us have heard about agile. Uh, usually we hear about it in the context of software development. It actually was originated in manufacturing. Toyota, one of the great innovators uh, who created the lean uh, methodology for manufacturing, they also created the agile methodology. And that was just like lean was inherited by software developers Agile has been developed, uh, inherited by software developers. It stands in contrast to the more traditional waterfall approach to building software. And you're gonna learn a lot about that today uh, from Brenda in the initial presentation. But what's happened is this Silicon Valley methodology that has been used to build scalable software is now finding its way into all other industries and sectors of the business world. And one of those areas is marketing agencies. Starmark, one of the leading digital marketing agencies in South Florida for many years, went full hog into Agile as the way to run their business and service their clients. And Brett Searcy led that transformation, which was featured in the Wall Street Journal. And we're gonna have him today as one of our featured panelists to talk about the case study and the lessons he learned in how to apply this manufacturing and software mindset and approach and methodology in the marketing world. We're gonna to talk to him both about how he runs and service it, runs his agency and services his clients. We're gonna also talk about how you can use that to more effectively market your business. So it's uh, gonna be a great session today. Um, I wanna first acknowledge our partners who make BizHack Live possible. We are sponsored by the South Florida Integrated Marketing Association, Miami Marketers, and the American Marketing Association. We also are partners with CIC, the co-working space in Midtown Miami, and Creation Station Business, which is one of the uh, great resources for small businesses out of Broward Library in uh, Broward County. I also am excited to announce that we have uh, cemented a partnership with Grow with Google, Google's educational and small business outreach arm. And next week, we are announcing today that next week we're going to have what we are calling Grow with Google Week. There are th uh, two events that we're going to have. One is making your website work for you. Uh, this is going to be on uh, Tuesday, April 22nd. And then on Friday, April 23rd, um, those dates seem a little off, uh, is gonna be the Reach Customers Online with Google. So I think that actually should have said uh, Thursday, April 22nd, and Friday, April 23rd. We're gonna be talking about some of Google's best practices related to how to find your customers online. Very excited to announce that partnership, uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about it before the end of today's presentation. Uh, without further ado, I want to introduce our two amazing panelists. Brenda Kwateng is the founder of Ingenuity Consulting Solutions, uh, ICSC, and she is a business transformation expert. She's somebody that people hire to help them use the agile methodology and, and scrum methodology in their business and how, how to do it and how to implement it properly. Um, Brett Searcy, uh, who works at Starmark, uh, is the chief digital officer, hired somebody like Brenda to help them make the transition. One of the things he'll, we'll talk about is why it's helpful to have a third party. Uh, even if you are expert in the methodology, it's helpful to have a third party, a consultant like Brenda, introduce it to your company because people just listen a little better when somebody else is giving them new ideas. Uh, and they're more open to new ideas when it doesn't feel like it's being dictated from on high. And Brett's going to talk about how buy-in is so critical if you do decide you want to institute this in your company. And frankly, on a personal level, BizHack is beginning to implement uh, some agile and scrum methodologies into our own business. And so from a selfish point of view, Brett uh, and Brenda, I'm excited to learn from you guys today how to make my business better. The, 
the subtext of all of these BizHack lives is I too am a small business owner trying to learn and trying to figure this out. And I, I just feel really honored that you've shared your expertise and your time with me and, and the BizHack community. Uh, so with that, I'm gonna introduce Brenda, uh, invite Brenda to the stage. Uh, she's gonna do a brief presentation that will give you kind of the, the fundamental uh, um, concepts behind the Agile methodology and then we'll go into a Q&A. Welcome, Brenda. Thank you so much, Dan. And I'm very honored to be here today with uh, yourself and with Brett and, uh, Brett and the BizHack team. Um, I'm very excited about your journey into Agile as an organization. Your culture and how you have exposed and grown so many organization has been phenomenal over the last couple of years. So I'm excited to see the growth. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen at this time. Hey, can everyone see the presentation? Thumbs up will looks, do. Looks great, perfect. Awesome. Thank you. So cultivating an agile mindset to benefit your business today. That's our topic of discussion. Um, and our goal here is to understand that, you know, if not, if you change nothing about what you're doing, nothing will change. Uh, we're now caught in a place where there are rapidly changing markets. Things are changing constantly. And as much as I know some people may want to codify this around the recent pandemic and what has happened over the last couple of years um, since 2019, but really it's been going on since before then. We have seen a digital transformation, a move and shift on how people engage and what they do to look and better um, are able to do their work. So we talk here about not only how we need to think differently and act differently, but quickly and adapt um, to not only stay relevant, but also to be in a position where our organizations have the opportunity to grow. So we're first gonna talk about the agile mindset because there is a difference between the mindset and methodology and mindset is really key in regards to how you're able to make this transition. Um, it's really creating and responding to change um, and specifically through turbulent environments. And people may say, well, you know, everything is not always turbulent. Not necessarily, but things are constantly changing. Um, and to be in a place where we're able to respond with our business, with our teams and provide services and products and now speak to the needs of the customer and can adapt to what they are keeping them and the focus of what we do. Um, thinking about how we develop and improve ourselves over time and look to make sure that we're really forging ahead in the market and creating a presence and a sense that our business stands alone and outside of those our competitors. Um, and I think the third key here, which is really important, and I think sometimes um, we forget, is that it's important to fail. And I say we forget, it's more we're uncomfortable. Failure is not a place where people like to be. Uh, we think that and we, we're known and we're cultivated as a society that we constantly have to succeed. But there is success and failure because it's an opportunity for you to learn. It's an opportunity for you to grow. It's an opportunity for you to now figure out what doesn't work to then do what does work and do it quickly. As we look at the methodology of Agile, we're now looking at a set of practices, not a process. It's about how you engage with and work with and create a culture around what you're doing. But in this case, when we look at Agile methodologies, we really root them in the four core principles of the Agile Manifesto. And the items that are bolded on the screen really are the focus of what those principles are. Individuals over interactions, customer collaboration, completed work and responding to change. Agile methodology really calls on and engages us as individuals to work together and to value each other in that process and have an understanding that this is about how we as a team and as a people move together and as an organization move together to create something better than we had before. As we do this process though, there are cycles and checkpoints that we should do in order to then not only allow ourselves to have a plan set of growth, a plan set of activities, but then also a check-in point to see that we're really moving forward. So as we look at the plan, do, check, and adjust and repeat process, we're constantly looking at how we are working and how we can improve or how we've done something and it hasn't worked and what we can learn from that. As we look at our uncertainties and <clears throat> identify those characteristics, we have to understand there's things that are internal to organization and those are external. 
And the external, we don't have as much control over, but if we're aware of them, then we're able to adapt to them. So there's no sticking your head in the sand like the ostrich. You've got to be out there and be open to and embrace and understand and at least learn, begin to seek some of the knowledge that's out there. Um, looking at your market shifts and, and uh, industry trends, looking at what your competitors do, which some people are like, well, why would I look at them? Well, that's considered your closest competition. There may be things that you're aligning on and things where you now see where you can make a difference. And then looking at how you can measure your effectiveness in the market, because measurement really is the tool that tells you and helps you determine how you move forward. When it comes to internal um, uncertainties, you know, looking at what your team most values and really making sure that your team knows and understands that they are the most important thing to the process. People run what we do. It is not a question of the product or service or what pushes us, but your teams in valuing the, the diversity and culture of the folks in your organization is going to make your actual implementation and your ability to work as a business that much better. Working as individuals and teams, putting together and changing your culture of how important it is and that synergy that diverse minds and diverse thoughts can actually bring and move an organization forward and how they're actually doing things. And allowing the individuals within this team environment to be able to feel confident and comfortable speaking up and providing their input so that you're able to better move forward as an organization. And then as we all, we spoke previously about looking at the plan, do, check, and, and, and um, act, but in the check, looking at the processes, what are common points of failure? What are common points of success? How do we improve our failures and how do we maximize and optimize and exploit our successes to move forward as an organization? So figuring out how to adapt. Well, it, it's a process and it's something that I would say that sounds very daunting, but look at doing it incrementally. Look at doing small pieces of work and then as, you've, as you're incrementally building upon that, re-examining and growing, it'll give you the opportunity then over time to see then really how you can grow. But don't feel as if you've got to take on everything. Change is hard regardless. And so doing it in a small way will not only bring some level of comfort to the process, but also some level of control to an extent. So that as you move your organization through this process, there is a buy-in and there is a support so that as the process grows, it's a tidal wave and they're now able to move forward with it. Giving your team and your set, uh, yourselves a time to think. Generally, we tend to work in such an urgent manner that the tyranny of what we're doing to produce is more the focus than looking at how we can do what we do better. So having set periods of time where you can one, look at what you have done, look at ways you can innovate, kind of get out of the space that you're in and look at doing things with a fresh eyes so that you now can bring a fresh perspective to what you're doing in your improvement process. And as I mentioned before, embracing failure. And it's funny when we say, well, you know, nobody wants to fail, but you think about it, have you ever seen a baby learn to walk without falling down? And they fall down constantly, but eventually they walk. And the same thing here, you may fail a number of times, but don't look as failure as, as if it's not a process you can't do and it's not something that you can't learn from in order to now grow and move forward as an organization. And measure, 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 measure. Um, Agile is really a science and it's really about data and the data is gonna help you drive. And even in, in those instances where you think something is a failure, where you are not, where you're, it doesn't receive the, achieve the adult um, results that you're looking for, but you now have the ability to use that data to predict how close you are or not towards where you wanted to go and use that analysis in that environment to then correct and steer your course. So I am now going to uh, stop my portion of the presentation and I'd like us to get the chance to speak a little bit with Brett. So I'll hand it back over to you, Dan, and we can go from there. Beautiful, thank you for that. Um, Brett, before we, we're gonna really do a deep dive with how you implemented this uh, in your company. And, and Brenda, I'm gonna invite you to just jump in with questions. Um, I've always found, you know, one of our, our core values at BizHack is learn by doing. 
And I think a case study is a great example of a learn by doing, you know, to understand, you know, in, in real detail, Brett, how you implemented this, why you implemented this and the challenges along the way. I think we'll take what Brenda uh, introduced um, about the mindset and the methodology uh, and, and give flesh to it, give, give reality to it. And I think there's going to be a lot of learning. And my job is to help you extract those lessons that can be applied to the folks who are joining us on the call. Mm -hmm. But uh, before we get to that, was there anything from a framework or conceptual level that you want to make sure that everybody understands before we dive in to talk about star mark in specific? Uh, yeah. And I, I think that, um, Brenda said it well, that, um, you know, agile is a mindset, you know, agile is actually a methodology, not a process. A lot of people kind of say it's a process or confuse it with a process. I think maybe saying it's a mindset is a better way of saying even than a methodology, because not everybody knows what a methodology is, but, um, it's a methodology that has a lot of processes underneath it. And so like, Dan, you mentioned Scrum at the top of the call, that's a process. A retrospective is a process. A roadmap is a, a process, right? Those processes are all inside of the Agile methodology. But I think calling Agile a mindset is really maybe the best way to describe it. And um, it's a mindset of um, continuous improvement and learning. And you know, a lot of that can involve all those little failures that Brenda was talking about. Um, you know, it's rapid, um, rapidly uh, making those adjustments, but it's, it's really testing and piloting something, you know, almost every two weeks in what we would call a sprint, which is, you know, sprint planning as a process. Um, so as long as you have a mindset of continuous improvement, then you can implement a lot of processes under that, um, you know, for implementing those continuous improvements. And, and really that's, you know, you know why, why this is a journey and not a destination. I love that. You know, just to kind of put this in language that some of our alumni might understand, um, we talk in our programs about mindset and skill set. Mm -hmm. And so the mindset, which we call the biz hacker mentality, is an agile mindset. You know, would you agree with that, Brenda, having gone through the program? Most definitely. <laughs> you know, and, and one of my favorite, this is actually from improv. I did a decade of improv, uh, improv comedy. And there's this great term we use there called dare to fail gloriously. And the idea was that, like, if you're going to fail on stage, you know, on a high tight rope, d fail big, right? Don't do it meekly. Uh, and it really is about creating, uh, obliterating your fear of failure in one of the most scary settings possible, which is public speaking in front of a strangers with no script. Mm -hmm. So the dare to fail gloriously. And what we do in the learn by doing methodology, the learn by doing approach is the learn by doing is the process. It's the system we're using to help you start to develop that mindset, right? Mm -hmm. So by running through what we call the nine step process, uh, we're really helping them practice developing a new habit and mindset, which is very unfamiliar to the type A, always got perfect grades folks who often end up taking these courses. Uh, you know, especially when it comes to educating yourself, the type of person who's attracted to a class is usually the type of person who's used to getting an A in the class. And there's no A's in life and there are no A's in marketing. It's does it work and how can we do better? So there's mm -hmm. no perfect, there's just better. Yeah, so I agree. let's let's dig in. Brett, let me start at the beginning. You, you guys have become a, a national model for taking a system that really saw, started in manufacturing and software and now is being applied in many, many industries, including the marketing agency and marketing industry. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious, is it because of your technical background uh, in software and technology that you even learned about the agile methodology? And, and tell me about the conversations at Starmark and, and the kind of how you had to get buy-in from your peers to even begin to implement it. You know, we, I actually don't know how you convinced the other internal stakeholders or how that process happened. Right. Um, well, it takes time. It certainly was an instant. Um, and probably my background in technology, you know, helped us to, you know, maybe hear about it sooner and, you know, understand its benefits, um, you know, maybe earlier on. Um, we, we, you know, um, one of our departments is um, our development department where we do software development and e-commerce and apps. 
And so we had a very large project around 2012, 13, 14 that we were started to use Agile on this one project. We didn't even use it on all of our clients or all of our projects. It was just like this one complex project that was e-commerce. We're like, we need to run this Agile because it's so complicated, it has so many moving parts. Um, and then, uh, you know, that was like a year and a half or something and just for one project with a small team. And then in 20, uh, end of 2014, we were doing our 2015 annual planning. So Starmark does like a retreat every December, early January, where we try to create an annual plan, just like most businesses do. And in this one, some of my other team members were like, you know, we really should expand this to everything else because it would help. Like, this, like some of these other projects are still using Waterfall are very painful. And this one is going pretty well. And it's very complicated. So it's a complicated project going well. Why are these simple projects so painful? Right. And so I kind of brought it up at our annual retreat saying, you know, for 2015, we should go agile. And then like, what does that mean? Like now it becomes the buy-in part. Right. So um, first things first, I just went on to Amazon and I found a, a very simple book on, on agile and I bought like eight copies, one for everybody. And, and it was only like, I don't know, 60 pages. It wasn't that big, but what it did was it, it started to use the language and the terminology Right. So then so that our leadership team could have a conversation about agile and understood what what a lot of the terms meant, like what is a, a user story and what is a sprint or a scrum or a roadmap or right. Like until you can know what the words mean, it's hard to even have that conversation. Um, so we read the book and we had a few conversations about it. And then we all agreed, like, you know, you know, we see the benefit in that project. We probably should do this. And then um, and then came the conversation of, well, you know, we need leadership buy-in, which you should all do. This has to be a top-down, like if, if leadership doesn't buy in on it, it doesn't matter how much the team wants it, right? If they're not supported, they're not going to be successful. So leadership kind of had the buy-in. But then it was like, well, we, you know, we can't make this a, like, we have to tell the team they have to be agile, right? And then that's when we started to look for an outside consultant who could come in and um, be an authority on the topic, because we clearly were not. Well, we had a couple people in the office who had been doing it for, for years or even at previous jobs before they were working with Starmark, you know, none of us had ever, ever done it in the world of marketing. So even though we were using it in the software development department, we had not used it in marketing, right? So we're like, we really need an outside expert. We interviewed um, a, a couple. There weren't that many firms in the world of marketing at that time, to be honest. Um, and then uh, probably by summer, we had like, picked a firm, we had set up a schedule, they were gonna come in for some training. And we had to shut the agency down for a week to retrain the entire staff for five days. And so we're like, wow, when, you know, how and when, you know, we've never done that before. This is crazy. How are we going to do this? Um, and so we kind of, it took some time to get that on the schedule. We ended up getting it on the schedule in August of, of 2015. So that process really went from like December planning till August implementation, right? So that, that took time. Um, so I don't want to, anyone to think like you can start doing this next week. I mean, you could, but, um, but there's a lot of moving parts and it depends on the size of your company and the size of your agency and the number of clients and all of those things. Um, using an outside source, they were able to give examples of how other firms or how other agencies or how they're even internal marketing departments, like, you know, Ford uses it for their internal marketing department. Let me give you a marketing example, right? And so mar people are able to ask questions to an outside authority. They were give, able to give marketing examples. Um, we were able to kind of sit back and let them um, do their thing. And I think that was super helpful for the staff to, to you know, feel energized about everything. You know, they had the, the science behind it, the, the research that had been proven X, Y, and Z. They had the, the story about Toyota and the story about, right? So they just brought a lot of um, flavor that got everyone super jazzed. And um, so, yeah, we started in uh, our sprint one was in August of, of 2015. So, so eight months from kind of concept to the full full implementation and it had already been happening in one of the departments that you ran right. the technology folks so it wasn't right. even new to the company brenda um before we really dig into the implementation and the and, and and the and the challenges and some of the lessons that came out of that if somebody starmark hires you and you're now helping kind of basically uh popularize and, and answer questions about this new methodology uh, among staff. And if I'm on that staff and I say, this is a lot of work, why are we doing this? Why bother with this? What is, what is the, the why behind uh, Agile? The biggest thing 
the, in terms of the why behind Agile is the ability to provide you value for what you're doing that much sooner. Um, as Brett alluded to, you know, they were doing a number of simple projects that were in a waterfall process. So that would mean that essentially any value that came out of whatever that project is, doesn't come till the end. And that can be in some cases, not two, three months, but six months, nine months, even a year. In the Agile process, you have value in terms of building and you're building in a modular fashion towards whatever your eventual goal is. And that value can be seen within the team and actually demonstrated to everyone within potentially two to three weeks. So now having a place where you have a sense of you're moving in the right direction and not wasting that time and waiting until the waterfall delivery six to nine months from now is the, the biggest point of um, value, value, using value again. But the biggest point that I think allows businesses to understand that they are on the right path and not wasting time and money to get to build the wrong thing. Um, and we're getting some great questions. Andre, Linda, thank you. Linda was asking, can you give a, a small example, Brenda, first of a waterfall approach and then what an agile approach would look like in contrast, just to kind of set the frameworks? Sure. So in a waterfall approach, you spend a lot of time upfront planning, um, gathering information about the requirements of whatever it is that you're trying to build or service you're going to be providing. Um, and then there's a development period where the information is taken off into that black hole or black box and worked upon. And then ta-da, at the end, this is what I've built. And it's hopefully what you had um, expressed in those requirements. With Agile, you now take the concept of what you have and take a little portion of that. And so it should be a little bit more um, tactical here. So if you are um, building a phone, for example, and you're not sure that the phone that you're building is really going to get to, you know you want to build a phone, you want to be able to talk and you want to be able to have apps. So now let me break apart this process and say, okay, let me build the phone and now you're able to here is this the way is this is what you thought the functionality was going to be on the phone great okay i've delivered that now let me move on to the next thing what is the screen to look like what are the things you want it to see how do you want to be able to visualize from it so you build upon the components of it but you're delivering them through the process so there's more confidence that you're one going to get to where you want to in regards to the end product but also then there's confidence in the regards to the fact that you are now building something that'll be usable and that can, in some cases, if it's something that's already developed and you're doing incremental um, improvements, can actually be released, released to the market to be able to then say, yes, this is what we want, or no, it isn't, and adjust accordingly. Right, so, so Agile is like a, a project, a, a, among other things, it's a, an approach to projects where you don't kind of you know, huddle in the corner uh, and build the perfect thing and then ta-da, here it is. Uh, it's, it's basically you break it up into little pieces and you sequence those pieces and you're doing little mini ta-da's every two weeks uh, where you're saying, hey, check this out, and then it breaks and then you go back and you fix it and you build something new. And the idea is not to let the perfect be the enemy of the good. Um, Brett, Let's take this to the complex projects that you were working on as a marketing agency. So, you know, I'm hiring you to generate leads for my company. Uh, how does the agile methodology, like I get it for a phone, but how does it work for an agency that's doing lead generation or branding for a company? How does that work? Sure. So what we would probably do if you were a, a new customer is we would propose to you that we're going to create a, a roadmap for your project where we're going to define your, um, your, or try to get a better understanding of your current state. And we call that program context. Like what's the existing situation, the current competitors, the current state of things, the current affairs, the current environment you're trying to capture leads in, right? Then we're going to set some goals. We're going to say, what are your business goals? I don't, I don't want to know your marketing goals necessarily. I want to know your business goals because I want to make sure our marketing goals roll up to and support those business goals. Um, and that's simply called goals. And then we create what's called platform and approach as part of this roadmap. And this is where uh, the team who's actually going to work on your project is going to start to say, all right, you know, here's social media and analytics and UI UX and copywriting and art direction. And, you know, these team members are going to start to say, all right, here's what I think we, I need to deliver for us to meet these goals in this operating environment. Right. And so when Brenda mentioned in Waterfall, like you create a requirements document, like a business BRD, a business requirements document, or you have a strategy doc, right? The only person who understands that is the person who wrote it. 
right? Because what we're doing is we're taking all of the team members who are going to work on your project and they're experts in what they do. So if they're doing paid search or social or SEO or copywriting or art direction or, right? They're going to say, this is what we need to meet these goals. So now the team who are the experts are kind of creating the platform and approach to that. We would work through this roadmap with you. And then a critical part of this process, the roadmapping process, which is under Agile, is that we walk you through it with the team members and we have a conversation about every single thing we're recommending, right? And this creates mutual alignment. And this lets the team hear directly from you. And, and sometimes you might bring a couple employees and you're not internally aligned and we will unearth that during this process. And then we love to sit back and watch you guys talk about it and try and create alignment. Because that would, in a waterfall approach, that would not be found until the ta-da moment, right? And then you're redoing everything, right? But we're unearthing this right up front. And that is super valuable to us, to our team, and to you from a project perspective. So when you were introducing these concepts, um, one of the things I remember you told me is that you tried to reduce the techie language. Uh, you're yeah. dealing with marketers, creative types, you know, copywriters and graphic designers and art directors. Uh, how did you um, approach, you know, going something that's been used for manufacturing and technology and applying that to more creative fields? Yeah. Um, so one of the things that was really important when we did this change in 2015 is, and it is a major structural change is we eliminated our departments and we created work streams. So we used to have a creative department, a digital department, a media department, right? And then an account and strategy department, right? And waterfall would be, okay, strategy would give it to creative, creative would give it to digital or creative would, or digital would give it to media, right? It was, that's waterfall. And what we did is we created two work streams and each work stream is like now each has team members in it. So they all sit together. So creative and copy and media and strategy and analytics and UX sit next to each other, right? And so what, what that does is um, it allows, um, the, the conversations about your project to always happen uh, together as a, as a team. I don't think I fully answered your question though. Well, yeah, talk about just, you know, what were the, some of the ways you tweaked, like think about how you were running yeah, yeah. Agile with your tech team and then Agile as a company wide right. and some of the tweaks you had to make to make it more, you know, less of a, 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 you know, swallowing an elephant for those folks. For sure, yeah. So for breaking down the department structure, into work streams was number one. Then once that team started to work together, right, a lot of things became apparent and transparent that might've been hidden before. Like, you know, how come media isn't explain, you know, dictating what creative should be created or what is needed, like, you know, right. And um, so then um, we, that, that is the team that would roadmap your process. Like I told you earlier, your project. And what, what we found is that we need to use plain English in everything we communicate. Um, not only amongst our team, but also with our clients, right? So we don't want to use acronyms. Um, when, when these were in person, we would actually put a big white post-it on the wall. And if anybody said any acronym, we would put the acronym down and we would write out what it meant, right? Because we're, again, we're trying to create understanding. And so we try to use plain English and, and try to define all of our acronyms because, uh, again, we want to know all this information up front. We don't want to find out at the end of a project, oh, that's what you meant? Like, we want to know what you mean and what you say are, the, are kind of the same things. And so plain English is super important to that. And we, we call that mutual understanding. So what I, at the end of a roadmap, there's lots of things you want to get out of it. You want to understand the scope. You want to understand the budget. You want to understand the timing, right? All I say I want to get out of it is mutual understanding. If I can get mutual understanding out of it, I win, right? Everybody wins. That's my goal from a roadmap is mutual understanding. Perfect. Brenda, anything you want to share about meaningful language? There's a, there's something that I heard that, um, that something that I was taught in one of my accelerator programs, which is the, the two scarcest resource, resources in times of change is will, willingness, and meaningful language. Will, I mean, look, if you don't have buy-in, it doesn't matter, right? You're never going to make it happen. They're going to be fighting you the whole way. But in a time of change, meaningful language, which is what Brett's really talking about, is utterly essential. Everybody needs to understand what you mean by these new processes, these new methodologies, these new mindsets. And there needs to be a shared agreement. And it almost doesn't matter what words you use. You could call it eggplant. You could call it whatever. You know, <laughs> avoid words that cause confusion. And this is, frankly, a good marketing lesson as well. So if the word scrum 
uh, you know, doesn't make sense. And what the hell is a scrum? What word do you use for that, Brett? Check in. Check in. I think we can all pretty much get what a check in is. Scrum is not a word anybody really knows what it means. Right. Unless. So, so that's the idea, meaningful language. And Brenda, how have you as a consultant found meaningful language is an important kind of I issue with your clients? Um, and I, I would go back to what Brett says in terms of being able to engage mutual, mutual understanding. Because unless you're communicating on the same page, unless you truly are ensuring that whoever you're speaking with within your teams and even externals with your customer, there is a solid understanding and a um, buy-in to whatever is the process of, that you're promoting. You don't have it. And so you, you might as well have just fallen off as we refer to it as a train. Um, and the train refers to in terms of um, the, the, well, we refer to the train as work that's being done on the journey to get to where you want to go, very much like the implementation roadmap that um, Brett was speaking to. And so you now want to get buy-in for everyone that they understand they're buying a ticket. They're getting onto this train to be able to now get to a journey. And what's the information they need to, kn to know in order to be on that journey and to be confident and comfortable in what they're doing and that we're going to produce what is expected down the road. Um, I do want to go back to one thing that Brett spoke of in regards to how they changed the, their organization. Um, instead of going from these um, silos of specific departments. And generally when you have an organization and it grows within those departments, there ends up being conversations that take place within the department, but not between departments. And so in this engagement of agile, we now have an open conversation, even to the point of marketing may say, well, you know, we're coming up with these um, marketing schemes and we want to use a five color uh, preference in regards to whatever we're developing. But then when you now get to UX, UX is like, but you realize that that now causes additional problems in terms of cost, in terms of marketing, in terms of whatever. But a lot of times those conversations don't take place. It's we've produced it, tossed it over the wall and given it to someone else to work on. Now we have the conversation of we're working together. So wait a minute, if I give you a five color palette, that's gonna cause these challenges. Okay, we can adjust, we can go to three. Or why are we going to five and what is the value and how can we better engage what we're doing for the customer? So I think the co conversation, not only outside and, and with a language with your external customer, but internally working a lot stronger and better together in order to produce something better for everyone else. Yeah. Brett, you want to weigh in on the people element of this? You know, we're talking a lot about systems and processes and mindsets, but in the end, it's really a different way of people working together that works better. That's research backed mm -hmm. and science backed and it gets better results faster. It gets better results with, uh, you know, a better end product. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. And, um, you know, you said at the beginning, um, like when you bring in an outside consultant, like the people are like, like, what's in it for me? Like, <laughs> right, you're, you know, you're going to learn some new processes, but these are going to make your life better. You're going to be happier. You're going to be involved sooner in the process. So things aren't a surprise. You're going to know why things are being done. You're not going to be told what to do. You're going to come up with the best idea, right? So there's a lot of things in it for, for the staff. And I think that is important. Um, also, you know, this is not for everyone. Um, like as a traditional agency, uh, from some regard, you know, we had like project managers whose job it was to tell people what to do every day. Okay. That is not a big role in the world of agile. Like really, like those people are not happy about agile because they don't have anybody to tell what to do anymore. Right. So, um, you know, there is going to be some angst when you, when you go to implement this thing based on however big your company or your department, internal marketing department, um, might be. But I really think that, you know, um, you know, we, you know, we have a, um, one of the processes in agile is a, a retrospective at the end of every two week sprint. We do call it a sprint. We call it a retro. We call it a check-in, not a scrum. We call it a, a storyboard, not a Kanban. So, you know, we're marketers. So we try to use the marketing terms for this, but at retro, everybody gets a voice to say, what can we do next sprint to run the next sprint better? Um, that forum never really existed company-wide pre-agile, right? It might've been in a department, like we'd have a digital team meeting once a month and we say, how, you know, how can the digital department run better, right? But it was just, it was a silo. Now it's a company-wide discussion. How can the entire company run the next sprint better? And sometimes people will say, you know, oh, when, you know, when copy does this, you know, it would be better if they did it that way or when account does this or when art does that, right? They can talk to each other to make running the entire project smoother. It's not just a siloed 
feedback loop either. And so the staff that, you know, we did a, we actually did a four year retro, it's on our website, um, starmark.com slash agile, where we said our first four years, like what we learned. And we kind of analyzed, and when you talk about failure and what, what worked and what didn't, like we tried a lot of things, right? Because it's a continuous improvement process. And so every two weeks, people would bring stuff up and we would try them. And sometimes we'd be like, that was great. Let's roll it out to every project or roll it out to every sprint or what, you know, and sometimes we'd be like, oh, that didn't work so well. Let's, you know, let's try something else. And, and so A, giving people yeah. that feedback loop makes them happier. And then B, you know, continuing to, to have a, a, a forum for them to have a voice also makes people feel empowered. So could you just talk quickly about just the mechanics of the the daily check-ins and the bi-weekly re retros, just sure. the mechanics of how the meeting's organized. And yeah. that question came from Cheryl Cattell of Starmark. Uh, uh, great to have you here. Sure. So um, every morning, each work stream gets together for about 10 to 15 minutes in um, a, a, a scrum, which is sometimes called a stand-up because you're supposed to stand up. Um, the science behind standing up is that the meeting will be shorter, right? And we need this to be short. So there is a reason people stand at these, like from a why perspective. Um, but basically, everybody goes around and around Robin. Um, somebody, a different person runs that that meeting every morning. So if there's eight team members, they just go around. Like I'm running it Monday, I'm running it Tuesday, I'm running. It. And everybody says, "What did they accomplish yesterday? What do they plan to accomplish today?" Um, and then the and then the third thing is like, do they have any blockers? And blockers just means like, do I need to collaborate with someone? Do I need information from someone? Do I need credentials or a login I don't have? Like, you know, am I literally blocked? Right, but any, any, any kind of collaboration that might need to occur. We wanna focus the conversation on accomplishments, not status, right? And we wanna focus the conversation on valuable information, not I was in a meeting from one to two and then another meeting from three to four and then another, like, right? So, and these, got, these go quick. So each person is like less than a minute. We try to be. Um, the person running the meeting, you know, will, will like, hey, if your conversations start, they'll, they'll cut it off. They'll like regroup, you know, regroup afterwards or whatever. So once everybody does that, then like the managers and the strategists and everybody else is listening to this team have this conversation. Everybody in the entire company now knows what is going to be ac accomplished by everybody in the entire company in 15 minutes. Right. And this is amazing. Um, in the in the waterfall world, you would spend hours interrupting people all day long, asking them what are they working on and what are they going to have this done and this is due Friday, is it on track? All of that happens so quickly now with no interruption. You know, it's really great, and the team feels very empowered. And then at the end of that, oh. managers can reprioritize. So the people who are observing might be like, "Oh, I love your plan for today, but can you do this one first and do that one second instead of that one first and this one second, right?" So the managers are making sure they're they're listening. They want to know that the thing that is important is being said. They want to know it's in the right priority. They want to know that it's on track. And if something is not or something needs to adjust, we do it at the end. Because part of the science of Agile is it's easier to adjust a plan that's in place than to create chaos when there is no plan in place. So, so before we get to the retro, BizHack, in preparation for today, introduced the daily check-in. Uh, into our methodology, we actually have a, our chief of operations, our head of operations is trained up in agile and scrum. And so she's been running those meetings and they're brutal, man. It's like, uh, you know, we actually use, I use the term eggplant uh, as a, as a safe word in my company because uh, it's purple it's and purple. I talk too much. So whenever <laughs> anybody says eggplant, it means I'm talking too much. So the first couple of days it was like eggplant, 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 but now <laughs> like, the meetings last seven minutes. And then what happens is, you know, we'll identify an issue and we'll just say issue, you know, Lilia, you and I need to have a chat today and then we'll just take care of it there. Or, uh, you know, if it's something that requires all of us, we'll kind of finish the meeting and then tackle it within the 15 minutes. And then if it doesn't get finished in that 15 minutes, schedule a follow up for later in the day. But it's really amazing because uh, what. I realize is so much time is wasted with a lot of blah, blah, over explanation yeah. and peacocking and, you know, statusing. And, you know, if you just kind of walk through it um, and, and uh, it, it can move really fast. So let's talk about the retro. So this is every two weeks. There's like a, you know, you have something to show, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, so what we do is, as a marketing firm, we try to say it is a celebration of the work we completed, 
right? And so we all get together the last hour of the last Friday of the sprint. At the office, we had a bar. We would get beer and wine and goldfish and peanuts and put up on the screen, here's what we accomplished this sprint. And we would show the work. We'd show videos or websites or articles or, you know, whatever the team was working on, reports, analytics, you know, SEO, whatever. And we're trying to celebrate the work um, and close out the sprint with as much work that can be completed as possible. Um, but another process in the retro is where everybody gets to, um, there's like, again, using a card-based system, everybody gets a voice and they can say, there are four categories, things we want to uh, stop doing next sprint, start something we want to start and test or try or pilot next sprint, something we want more of, like, I mean, we might be doing it on one project or in one work stream or with a couple people or a couple writers, we want more of this. And then something we don't want to change anything. It's going well, don't change it. And so everybody gets a voice in one of these four topics and everybody can recommend anything they want. Now we're not gonna tackle it all next sprint, but we can all agree like, hey, we wanna pick two or three of these things and we wanna try to work on those two or three things next sprint as sprint goals. And we wanna try to make do those things. Could you say those four categories for the retro again? Yeah, start, stop, speed up, which means more of it, and keep on, which means don't change anything. That's cool. I, that, I've never heard that. I've always done what worked, what didn't, what next. But mm -hmm. start, stop, speed up, keep on is mm -hmm. kind of another approach to looking back and figuring out. What, what do we want to try next sprint? Right. And we're like in sprint 147 now, like five and a half years in. Right. And we're still doing this and people still have cards. And this is why I'm saying this is a journey. Right because this is not a, a destination. There's always something you can do. Like when, when we had a hurricane come through, we, you know, there was a bunch of cards, pandemic hits, there's a bunch of cards, like a new client, like overwhelms one work stream. There's a bunch of cards, like, so there's always something going on that we need to adjust. And so this is a forum that allows us to, to tackle the high priority, high value items. Yeah, this is a mindset and a methodology of creating a learning organization, Brenda. Yeah, I did want to um, throw in, I know we kind of moved on from the scrum stand-up uh, conversation to retrospective, but as we were back in the the, the kind of uh, check-in conversation, what I do with a lot of the teams that I have organizations is that when we speak of like the project manager and they feel like their role is no longer really um, valid or they don't have a place. So what we do is that that particular role then becomes what we refer to as a scrum master or an individual that's whose role is to basically remove those blockers. And the reason why this, the project manager um, evolving into this role is really good is because they have a strong background and understanding of whatever it is that you're building. And so then if there's a need and has been expressed through the team that there's challenges, there's blocks, there's integration, there's something that they need from another team in order to allow them to get their work done to deliver for the end of this particular sprint or iteration, that person is in that key point to go ahead and go off and do that. So it allows the team members to focus on the work that they've said they're going to do. And someone else is working on the problems in order to get them the information to work forward. Mm -hmm. So I did want to- That's a great point. point yeah, project problem. managers are very process oriented as well. So they do very good at Scrum Master. Yeah. You know, I want to just take a second and just, if, if there's one very easy to implement takeaway from this, I do think it is the daily standup, uh, especially when you're in a remote environment. I find it's just easy to lose. A lot of those, um, you know, connections that happen in the hallways and at the bathroom where you're kind of getting caught up and communications are broken down right now in remote workplaces. So I think it's an essential uh, tool, but it's not just me. Um, scaling up, which talks about the Rockefeller habits. One of the Rockefeller habits is a daily scrum, is a 15 minute stand up. When I was at the Miami Herald and we were planning the next day's paper, all of the editors, I had the radio department, we had what we literally called it a stand up meeting and we would all stand up and talk about what we were covering the next day. When I was at Liberty Power, a billion dollar energy company, we all got on an 8 a.m. Uh, leadership phone call and we did a scrum. I, I never knew that that's what it was called, but that particular methodology I think is extremely universal right now in business. There's a lot of science behind it and it's dead easy to implement. It's dead easy. It's 15 minutes a day that saves you hours of angst. Um, let's talk about, you know, tips, like concrete tips, um, short of like the, the full scale implementation of agile. Are there any other things besides scrum that 
you could implement tomorrow or without a lot of pain and that will immediately start seeing benefits to your organizations. I'll start with you, Brett. Any advice that you have about that? Mm -hmm. Well, I definitely think uh, the Scrum is a, is a good thing to do. Um, it's an easy one to implement. Don't think just because you're doing Scrum though that you're doing Agile. And this is why I was saying Agile is a methodology and Scrum is a process. Scrum is a great process um, to do. If there are other things that might be easy to do, um, you know, processes or not, like, you know, they, they all work together. Retrospectives you could do, um, but, but if you don't have work that has a closeout date, that might be a little difficult. Um, a simple thing though, is honestly just form a lot more stuff in the phrase of a question, right? Instead of telling people, ask them because they're subject matter experts. They might have an opinion. They might have knowledge you don't have, right? As a, a senior person at my agency, um, I have a lot of knowledge on a lot of topics, but I don't have the depth that it, my team members have, right? And so when I, when I phrase things as the form of a question, I will sometimes get into that depth that I don't have and be able to make more informed or better decisions. So a lot of Agile is just really just about asking um, in the form of a question to get their brain power to be part of the plan or part of the program or part of the blueprint, right? That's like what we're trying to get out of the people who work on the work. Um, I would say from my perspective, um, creating a simple dashboard or radiator, and I'm, and I'm assuming, Brett, you have something when you're in the office where there's an ability to visually see where people are within the project and within the, within the stream of work that they're doing. Mm -hmm. um, as we talked about up front, measuring and having understanding, one, of what you're measuring and then tracking it is going to be really important. But having something visually that's available, so now in a remote environment, it, it may be just a website where as people are working and whatever you're using to capture their work, it updates this information. So people can quickly go to that dashboard and have a sense of where they are within the project. Um, that one helps them overall with, even in, a, in a um, kind of disbanded working environment, everyone's on the same page in regards to what's being accomplished. And if there, there's progress that should have been made that's not being made, it can be easily seen and then addressed a little quicker. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Th that actually leads me uh, to a question from Linda Russell. We're going to enter now a lightning round, sort of like the scrum methodology. You know, we're going to keep this short and sweet. Uh, I'll ask the question and then give it to one of you to answer and try to keep it to a couple sentences max. Um, so with Linda Russell, she asked, is there a project management software that supports this process? I'll start with you, Brett, and ask if you guys use a software to support this. And then I'll go to Brenda to see if there are other softwares out there that are work for this as well. Yeah, for sure. So after we, uh, this is a lightning round, so I'll try to be brief, but after we did our five day company shutdown and we all retrained, then once we knew what Agile was, we started looking at software programs afterwards because what we wanted to do was find a program that supported the way we worked we didn't want to have to work the way the software worked which might be anti-agile right so it was very important we actually analyzed i think five um the biggest one in the marketplace is called jira it's by atlassian um it's it's kind of technical it's used by a lot of software development companies we went with one called target process because it's a little more friendly for like creatives and media people and people maybe who are not as technical um, but there were four or five agile specific project management tools that we reviewed before we ended up on um, kind of finalizing it down to uh, JIRA and target process. Perfect. And Brett, if you have a second, you can put those into the chat. I'm sure people will be interested in maybe following up with those. Brenda, any others that you would say are particularly good for non-tech tech companies, for, for folks trying to put agile in other business settings? They're definitely uh, Trello and Asana. A uh, real basic, very visual, you get a very easy feel of what's going on um, and not a necessarily a lot of um, lead up time in regards to getting used to the, the tool. Yeah, we Trello was one of the ones we looked at. Um, it, it just, it wasn't um, enterprise enough for the volume that we had at Starmark, but if you have a smaller firm or a smaller agency or a smaller marketing department, or you wanna test something, Trello is great. I'm a full believer in Trello. The amazing Omi Diaz Cooper, great to see you, Omi, asked, how would this work for an agency when you have a small team, five to six people, and multiple client projects do at the same time? That's exactly how it works. <laughs> Our work streams are kind of like small teams, and they mm -hmm. each have like 10, 8 to 12 clients in them. And every two weeks, we have projects that are all due by the end of the sprint for all of those clients, right? So we don't say everything is done the last day. We try to say, all right, we're going to start delivering stuff 
you know, the first week of the sprint, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, we don't want to be delivering stuff to the client on the last day of the sprint because then there's no time for them to get feedbacks or comments. So when you plan out a, a two week chunk of work, you need to sequence that work, prioritize it and sequence it. So all that work can be done in those two weeks, right? Um, and so there's definitely multiple, a small, you know, multiple smaller teams working on multiple clients uh, to do that. Um, that's how we do it. Brett, with your permission, I'd love to connect you with Omi because she runs an incredible agency uh, uh, that does a lot of work with marketing automation and email. And, mm -hmm. and uh, I think there's a lot she could learn from you. Um, sure. We have a, thank you. We have another. I think I, I already know Omi actually. I'm <laughs> so. Oh, okay. Yeah. Omi, <laughs> totally reach out to Brett. He's got a lot more to share and he's uh, so generous with his expertise. Um, we have a number of great questions uh, from uh, Cheryl um, uh, Cattell, and one of them is, what was the biggest benefit of converting to Agile, and then what was the biggest challenge? And I want to actually transition using this question to talk about some of the risks and some of the failure points, but uh, why don't we start with your biggest uh, benefit of converting to Agile, Brett? Um, yeah, I mean, I think benefit is that the... Um, I don't know, the, maybe the volume of work that we can analyze and process and put through um, is, is, you know, greater um, because we're not doing a lot of the work twice, uh, meaning we don't have to do it over again at the end because there was a misunderstanding or mis there wasn't mutual understanding. Um, so I think that's probably a benefit to, to, the client, it's a benefit to the employee who doesn't have to do something twice. It's a benefit to the agency, right? So that really benefits every, every party. There's really nobody that doesn't benefit. Um, the challenge is- um, Wait, Let me just put a quick point on that because we talked about this earlier. It hasn't come up yet. What we're sort of doing is we're taking away the significant pain that can often come at the end of a project when at the end and you do the aha, uh, here, ta-da, here it is, and you realize it isn't what it was supposed to be. Mm -hmm. uh, and you kind of shift that to a lesser pain in the upfront planning road mapping process. So yes. it is painful to road map something, but it's way less painful than to have to redo work. Sorry, so uh, that was something you guys wanted That's to a share. a good point. Like, a lot of people come in and ask, is this going to save me time? Right. Maybe it will definitely save you pain. And that's right. probably enough reason to do it. Yeah. Uh, you were going to talk about, uh, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I agree. I, I, I don't want to think people to think it will save you time because I agree. Um, I, it probably can and it probably does, but in our world, it does not. What it does is it really takes the pain time at the end of a project where you're doing things twice, you have to work later weekends, and it just moves it up front to planning time. So you're going to take longer to plan create mutual understanding so that you don't are not working nights and are no longer working weekends. And that is how, you know, work-life balance works. Right. But at the end of the day, it might still take eight weeks. Right. So I don't want people to think of shortcutting. Now it does allow us to do more volume. We have more bandwidth, but I don't want people to think the time is necessarily shortcut. So it's a good point. Thank you for um, reminding me of that. I would also say uh, before so you go to the challenges, Brenda, did you have something you wanted to add? Um, yeah, I think that, um, as you asked me, I've then of course completely lost my train of thought. Uh, but <laughs> I think that um, in regards to the time perspective, once you have the ability to deliver something and you have in, in a, it, so something that it would have taken you, Brett, six months to deliver, and now you have some agreement from your client within two to three weeks, I think energizes those individuals in that process. And they are more likely to continue moving forward with a small increment build knowing that they're on the right track. Um, instead of that, the lack of a better word, wasted time of creating something that really is no value for the, and the rework that you, you spoke of. Right, it's a waste um, of everybody's time. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. And, and we use the word ta-da too. Like ta-da in our world is a, a big negative. Like <laughs> there should never be a ta-da. So like we this, use that There shouldn't phrase. be surprises. You should completely should understand. Be. And I yeah. say completely, oh. but it's an evolution. Really understand what is being asked of you. It should not be a surprise that all of a sudden there's, unless there's a, complete shift change in the environment that nobody predicted. But by, by that, you should kind of have an understanding of what's going to be, be done. Yeah. Before we get to the challenges, the failures, and the risks, and Andre, I see your question, and I promise we'll get to it. First question, and the last one we'll cover. 
um, is I did want to ask you about client communication. So, Brett, we're going to share with you guys as a follow up. First of all, the the Agile Manifesto, which is like a really concise summary of the thinking and the science behind this. But we're going to also share with you Starmark's Agile page, where they talk about their methodology as a differentiating factor. And that's a client facing page. That's a sales page. So it sounds like you guys talk to your clients quite a bit about Agile and use it as a selling point. Uh, and you, there's a kind of another kind of onboarding process, which is onboarding clients to a different way of working. Could you, it's a big topic, I know, but could you talk about that piece? Because it's really important. Are we still in lightning, lightning round? No, this, this is, <laughs> this one, this one's too big for lightning. We'll go a All few right. minutes long and then we'll hit, the last part is we'll, yeah. we'll go back to lightning and talk about challenges. Right. Yeah. So just like what's in it for, for the employees, it's what's in it for the client, right? And so you have to communicate that and it is a selling point. And, um, you know, Dan, I think you mentioned earlier about um, the, the continuous delivery. Like we, what I like to say is a series of small successful projects leads to one large successful project, right? So if every two weeks we're delivering a small successful project, a small successful project, right? Every two weeks we're delivering something successfully. When we get to the end, there's no tada. You just have one large successful project. Now, some clients, and this is probably a great segue to the biggest challenge, I'll be honest. Like Cheryl asked, what's the biggest challenge? The biggest challenge is some clients fully embrace this. Some clients are overwhelmed. Some clients don't want to work harder up front with planning, right? And so if you're doing this for an internal marketing department, you have control. And when you're doing this with a variety of clients, some clients don't want to plan. They don't want to use their brain power and think too much about planning. They're like, can't you just know what I want? Can't you just do it, right? Right? And then some clients are like, oh my God, this is great. I need to do this in my internal department. How can I learn more about this? So you have a wide gamut of clients. And that probably is the biggest challenge is that no two clients are alike, right? And so we kind of, we do weekly status reports um, with all of our clients every week. And in the first week of the sprint, we say, here's the priorities. Here's what we're going to deliver. Here's where I'm going to get to you. And that report comes right out of target process so that it's up to date. So the team does their check-in and they move their cards at check-in every morning. The status reports are usually run by like 10 a.m. So everything is up to date and the clients can actually see the actual status of everything at that moment in time. So we always run the status reports after check-in so they're up to date. But then in the second week of a sprint, the check-in, where it's like, okay, here's everything we're planning to deliver. Are we getting feedback on this? Are you getting this or whatever? And then we always say, and here's what's planned for next sprint. Is this still the priority, right? So we're kind of, even if they don't know anything about Agile, they start to understand, oh, you haven't forgotten about this work. I know it's coming up. This is what is important. Or, oh, no, no, I just, things just changed. I need to pull this forward and make sure that's in next sprint. And then the clients start to use the word sprint back to us or, right. And then we're like, yay, you know, it's fantastic. And, you know, we celebrate because, but, um, but, you know, we do those weekly statuses to try to um, get them aligned and on board. And once they see the benefit to them, you know, they, they get that part. There is still some challenges with the roadmaps, though, because, you know, it, you're taking a lot of that pain out the back end and putting it up front. And sometimes they just want to go, go, go. It's not sexy. It's not exciting. We're not showing anything creative, but it's really important. So, you know, we talked about how this is becoming, especially with the Wall Street Journal covering you guys as a leader in this, a differentiating element to your company. Yeah. Do you have clients who come to you specifically because you guys use this methodology? So we've had multiple clients that worked with Starmark where the person left their company and went to work with someone else. And then within six months called us and said, we need, you know, Mark, you know, my current agency is not using agile. I can't go back to this crazy way of doing things, please help. Um, and so we've had, at, you know, at multiple clients or multiple people who were our main points of contact work for new companies, bring those clients into the Starmark fold. And are there, like, has your, has you, do you attribute some of the growth of Starmark to the fact, I mean, you mentioned, for instance, one of the benefits is your same number of headcount can now service more clients, right? So you've made more, that's a more efficient workforce. Mm -hmm. uh, you also mentioned that the product they tend to produce, it, the, the customers are more aligned with it, the clients are more aligned with it, and there's less of a need for revising and revision at the end. Mm -hmm. My question is more about the kind of top of the funnel question, which is, you know, 
have have the people who are in charge of the rainmakers for the company found that this has become an important part of the sales process of selling customers to use Starmark and even the weeding out process, firing clients that aren't willing to put in that upfront work? Yeah, top of funnel, I would say, you know, today, probably not much, right? Because there, there's not an educated buying force out there that understands agile. Um, you know, if it's if we're down to one or two finalists and the differentiating factor is agile, absolutely, right? For sure. Because we do use it in all of our communications. We do use it in all of our pitches and our new business efforts. And just like last week, I said, look, if you don't choose us, you should choose an agency that uses agile because once you start working this way, you will never want to go back to another way of work, right? So like, I'm very open and transparent about that. But at the top of the funnel, Uh, there aren't enough CMOs or marketers who understand agile yet to make that right. But I think it's coming. Like we did it five years ago today. We're talking on here, like in a few years, where's it going to be? Right. Uh, So we are invested that we know that time is coming, but at the very top, I still think it's not as much as when it comes down to like a deciding factor. Yeah. There's a good marketing lesson in this, which is I think star Mark star Mark stands apart for me right now as an agency because you've done this, it gives me a lot more confidence to refer people to you because I know you have a really solid process behind what you do. I mean, the bottom line is, okay, you don't have to use agile, but I hope you have a system, a methodology, right? If you don't, if the company can't articulate how we do things, get things done, stay aligned with our customers and with our internal teams, I mean, it's sort of logical and you might as well just use one that's sort of proven and science-based, you know? It's like, don't overthink this, guys. Like, this is is like a proven process. But it's also like when you're looking at agencies, there are thousands now that use Agile. You might as well use an agency that uses Agile, Mm -hmm. right? Because what's the alternative? There aren't great ones. Um, I was going to say, you have to remember when someone has a system, there's a predictability. If they don't, you are entering into chaos. And so as you're looking from a financial perspective as a client, that's one of the things you really got to make sure you hone on on. And and I do that with a number of my clients as we um, interview vendors, is that unless you have a system, what you're telling me you can produce really doesn't mean anything to me because you have nothing that shows any predictability, any level of confidence that what I'm going to do with you is really the result I'm going to get. And that's what I think, at least we seem to look towards more of a results-orientated focus versus just, you know, whatever. All right, we got to get off the kumbaya. So let's talk about the nitty gritty nasty parts, which is what are the biggest challenges and what are some of the failure points that you've experienced around implementing this? Areas where, you know, it just didn't maybe work as advertised or where there was just a tremendous amount of pain to getting to where you wanted to go. I'll start with you, Brett. Mm-hmm. Um, ch- yeah, challenge and failure points, um, you know, w- whether you use agile or not, you still need to be able to know your audience and read your audience, right? And so, like I said, we have lots of different clients, right? So um, we had a client come into a roadmap for the very first time. They weren't very briefed very well on what a roadmap was, what we were trying to get out of it and uh, felt a little overwhelmed and, you know, didn't like it. Um, And so, you know, lesson learned. We need to make sure that like way ahead of the meeting, we, you know, that the clients understand what road mapping does, what the benefits are, what we're going to cover, why we're covering it. We're going to break it into small parts, right? Number one. Number two, just because it didn't work for that one client doesn't mean the sky is falling and road mapping doesn't work and we should never do it again. <laughs> right. And so like, but those are those things that start to circulate internally agents say, oh, it didn't work for this one client. Maybe we're doing something wrong. Right. So like the, the both hands, so it's like, you know, you still got to read your audience and know your audience and make sure your audience is along on this journey with you, right? You still can't surprise them no matter what you're doing or what, what, you're, uh, what, you're, what that is. I'd say that's definitely one. From a, a challenge standpoint, number two would be, um, you know, we're mostly a project-based agency, not necessarily a, a full service AOR. We have a couple AOR clients, but mostly we're project-based. What that means is we estimate a project, we say sign here and we execute that project, right? We don't just say, you know, you're buying a bunch of heads at X dollars a month and you get X number of hours and do whatever you want with it, right? And so that actually fits very well into Agile because we estimate projects. But sometimes, you know, um, the clients still have a, a, a struggle with, you know, what am I getting for this cost and when am I gonna get it? And, you know, there's still always that too. So um, I think Agile helps to be transparent with the budgeting, 
right? In a water for all world, it usually be this business requirements document with a number at the bottom, right? We actually kind of itemize out every deliverable. We kind of tell them what sprint it's going to be in. And we're going to say, look, if you want us to bill you at the end of each month for every deliverable we shipped out the door for six months, like we can do it that way. We can divide it, right? So there is still like, like processing the way they handle finances and budgets in this new way. Sometimes that also has a few conversations um, that need to be figured out. And every client's different. Billing is different. Everybody handles finances different, right? So lots of things there about reading your audience. Brenda. Yeah, I would say from my perspective, um, I encounter a lot of clients that say they want to go agile. And then when they realize what they have to do, they get very scared. So press points, it's the education is making them and helping them understand what this path and journey is going to be like, how it's going to be different, but there is a, a, a value and there is um, a benefit to this process and there'll be a better understanding of who they are and what they want. Um, I think the other thing too that um, is uncomfortable at times is understanding from the information you have gathered from your market is the need to pivot and change. And you know, a lot of times clients come in sold on this is a direction we have to take. But as we go out and we look at uh, market research, when we've gone out and done um, um, different kind of pilots and gain that information to say, look, we now have data to say we got to move in a different direction. And that's not what you came in here and we're talking about. But for us to deliver you truly what's going to be a value, we've got to shift a little bit. Um, so that can be a little bit uncomfortable. Again, it's change. But doing it in a, in a manner and providing them the data to, to validate what we're doing eventually gets them on that same path and they move along quickly. So um, thank you guys for sticking around a few extra minutes. These questions have been good. There's a really interesting question that I don't fully understand, but I think is a really good one from Andre. He said, how do you estimate risks in the agile mindset? And so I think what's kind of at the base of this is when you're talking about assumptions and versus knowledge and you're doing the road mapping, there's a, that's a sort of a risk assessment, right? You're, there, there's some things that you don't know and you won't figure out till you get started. So how do you estimate risk? How do you estimate uncertainty and manage it in the road mapping process? Uh, and I'll start with you, Brett. Yeah, 100%. So in the road mapping process, there are two places where we, we discuss risk. One is in program context, which I discussed with you earlier, um, where I was talking about um, you know, business context, goals, platform and approach. There are six steps to that. The next three are um, success factors, which is like how project, project manage this project. The next one is risks and open issues. And the next one is doneness. How do we define when this project is done? So those are the six discussion topics in the strategy. So we have an entire sheet or discussion topic on risks and open issues. Open issues might simply be, we need this or we need that, or you know we need something else. And risk would be everything the team thinks is a risk or a headwind that will prevent us from being successful or some unknown that we need to find out or maybe we need to do an audit on X, Y, and Z. So we, we try to bring that up. And the way we handle it is through transparency. We actually send all the risks and open items to the client before the roadmap and say, if you can resolve or close any of these out before we get together for our mutual understanding exercise, that would be great, right? And so we actually send them over to them. And then the second part, the actual project roadmap where we're writing out all the deliverables that are gonna de deliver every sprint, um, it, there are three parts. There's the story, which is the deliverable. There's the success criteria that says, you know, for this to be successful, it needs to do this, 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 and this, and achieve that, and whatever. And then we can also put a risk right on that individual deliverable if we want to as well, and, and we call it a red card. So it's blue, yellow, and red. And red cards on an individual deliverable, again, are just being transparent with the client. This is an unknown, or this is a risk, or a problem, something we can't estimate on this particular deliverable. I can estimate everything that's in blue and yellow, but I can't estimate the red card until we have more information. So we're just trying to be as transparent as we can with the client, both with strategic risks and with tactical deliverable risks. Fabulous answer, great question. Uh, to wrap up, Brenda, I'll start with you. Um, what is a, a book, podcast, resource that you would recommend, website for somebody who is just totally intrigued and interested in learning more. Hmm. Um, you may have to come back to me because I need to think about that. I um, mean, the reason why I say think is because um, a lot of the books that I have read and I focused on around software. And so I want to make sure I give something that's credible. So give me a minute. So this is agile. I can go ahead and look. <laughs> 
Yeah. No worries. Well, that brings me to Brett. So um, Linda Russell was asking about that 60 page book you referred to. Um, so please tell us that. And then uh, the one that um, at the beginning of the process that you shared with yeah. your colleagues and then Actually, any other. I don't remember the name of the book and I should have looked it up before. The... <laughs> but it was it was it was really just about getting making sure we all the same lexicon and understood the terminology in the marketing world of what agile was. I'll find that and I'll send that to you as well. Babe. So here's what we'll do is uh, you guys know Lilia. She'll be uh, sending a follow-up email about midday tomorrow. So if you could get us any books, podcasts, websites besides the Agile Manifesto that you want us to include, we're going to be including uh, the Agile Manifesto, the Star Mark page with the video case study of using Agile, uh, and, and the Wall Street Journal article that featured uh, them, as well as Brenda's amazing presentation. Great. Thank you, guys. I am very grateful to you. I've learned a lot. Uh, I've been taking notes myself for things that we're going to begin to operationalize within BizHack. Um, and uh, I just wanted to take a sec and talk about some of our uh, really exciting upcoming uh, events before we uh, wrap up uh, today's uh, extended session. So uh, coming up in uh, BizHack Live, uh, next week we're going to be talking at this time at 1230, we're going to be talking about data and location data from one of the pioneers in the space, Foursquare. You might uh, remember uh, Foursquare as a check-in app that you used to check in when you went to a restaurant. They've converted themselves into an enterprise data uh, analytics company specializing in location. And Emily, who heads up those efforts, is going to be talking. Uh, next week is our Grow with Google week, and we have uh, on Thursday, uh, we have a presentation um, on make your website work for you. And then Friday, uh, we're going to be talking about reach customers online with Google. Uh, the following week after that, uh, we're going to be talking about brand and branding. And uh, Ed Delia, who's been working in this area for 30 years, has a trademarked process for B2B that he's developed that we're going to be talking about and how to use uh, the power of brand to grow your business. After that, um, I'm going to be coming back on stage and talking about what I have learned over seven years working with 700 businesses about how to consistently and systematically market your business. And similar to the agile methodology, too many of us do random acts of marketing. We throw spaghetti against the wall and we hope it'll work. And this is really, uh, over these years, we have been developing a systematic approach uh, to how to do that that is uh, science-backed and road-tested, and we recommend it, uh, and we'll introduce it during that presentation. Uh, if you're interested in signing up for all of these at once, we encourage you to join our Season Pass program, and uh, which you can find on our website, bizhack.com. With that, thank you guys so much. Uh, thank you to Brenda and Brett, uh, and th uh, we look forward to seeing you here next week at this time. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Bye now. Bye.